Hello, my dear students and the rest of the learners. Welcome to this presentation in which we are going to discuss on the topic operating systems application perspective. This is part one of a two part series of this presentation. My name is Meme JM, or you can simply call me Emily Swap. In this presentation, we are going to look at the definition of an operating system, the functions of an operating system, the types of operating systems, the factors to consider when choosing an operating system for your computer, the organization of information using an operating system, then devices under operating systems control, installation and the configuration of an operating system. Let's commence by looking at the definition of an operating system. An operating system is a set of programs that controls, supervises, and manages all the operations of a computer and acts as an interface between the applications and the hardware. It controls and supervises the hardware resources of a computer and provides services to other system software. The two main programs that makes up an operating system are the control programs that manages the computer hardware and resources by performing some major functions, and number two is the user or a programmer of the computer system. Once a new computer is purchased, the first program that is installed in order to enable other programs to be installed and to enable devices to function is an operating system. Therefore, without an operating system, the computer cannot function. When you turn on the computer, the operating system run and check to ensure that all parts of the computer are functioning properly. Once loaded, the operating system manages all activities on the computer and interacts with the input and output devices. Operating system provides a software platform on top of which other programs called application programs can run. Once a computer is turned on, the operating system remains in main memory until you turn the computer off. Application programs do not directly utilize the hardware resources, but they send messages through the operating system, which has the ability to give instruction to the hardware in order for the hardware to perform a particular task. The five main reasons as to why operate, number one, to increase the throughput, that is the amount of data processed within a given time. Number two, it was to improve communication between the user and the computer. Number three was to decrease the job setup time. Number four, it was to decrease the downtime. And number five, it was for the purposes of increasing the system's performance. So an operating system is a set of housekeeping instructions. The following diagram therefore shows how a user interacts with a computer hardware. From this diagram, we can see that you and me and other users form what we call the end user's level. The end user runs an application program and this interacts with the system facilities. It can be application packages, specialist software or command interpreters. In other words, the end users runs application programs, which may include the system facilities, application packages, specialist software, or command interpreters. Then, based on the application program that the user has interacted with, that program sends user's request to the operating system, which can be of various types. For example, Android, Windows, Unix, 
Macintosh ETC. Then the operating system controls the execution of the application requests by transmitting it to the hardware, which therefore receives and performs or does the operating system command or operates on the operating system command that has been received. What are the functions of an operating system? There are seven main functions of an operating system, which are number one, job scheduling, number two, job sequencing, number three, memory management, number four, it is interrupt handling, number five is error handling, number six is resource control, and number seven is the input output handling. Let's look at each of these functions one at a time, beginning with job scheduling. Job scheduling is arranging various tasks according to priority so as to determine which task will be pro processed first, making sure that the one that is being processed currently is closely monitored in order to avoid wasting the time in the processor. A job is a group of tasks that are taken as a unit of work for a computer, which may include one or more computer programs, files, and instructions to the operating system. Some of the job scheduling functions are, number one is controlling the loading and running of a program. Number two is communicating directly with the user and or the operator. Number three is dealing with user commands to organize files and run programs. So in job scheduling, the operating system prepares, schedules, controls, and more task tasks submitted for execution in order to ensure the most efficient processing. Job sequencing. This is arranging the list of jobs or tasks currently being run in a particular order in order to make it easy for the processor to execute them and to know how and when to fetch instructions and data for each task. Control is processed from one job to another in a systematic order, therefore adding system priority when more than one application program occupies the main memory. The operating currently being run and it clocks them in and out of the processor. Memory management. This is organizing the main memory into partitions that are called page frames, into which data and instructions are constantly assigned temporarily so as to determine which tasks will remain in it, are waiting for execution, and which one will be sent back to secondary storage in order to wait to avoid many tasks occupying the main memory at the same time. Instructions and data are retrieved from the memory with the use of co correct address when required so as to protect the memory used by one process from unauthorized access by another. The other file management functions include copying, erasing, renaming, opening, and backing up files. Interrupt handling. This is breaking from the normal sequential processing of the current task in order to do something else and then be able to return the control back to the program that was interrupted. An interrupt in this case is a break from the normal sequential processing of instructions in a program. The operating system determines the cause of the interrupt and it transfers the control to the most appropriate programs. Each hardware device communicates to the processor using what we call an interrupt request number or IRQ. So the six main sources of interrupts that are handled by the operating system are, number one is interrupt that is caused by power failure, number two, is a signal that is generated by the arithmetic and logic unit when it detects that an arithmetic or logical error has occurred. Number three is detection of parity errors 
causing malfunctioning of the hardware. Number four is interrupts that are generated by real-time clock time sharing. Number five is interrupts that arise from input or output devices. Number six are external interrupts that are caused by events such as operator pressing an interrupt key. Error handling. This is monitoring the status of the computer system and performing error checks, therefore alerting the user when an error occurs or is found and making suggestions on how to correct the error where possible. The operating system offers error correction routines in order to ensure there is smooth operations within the central processing unit. Resource control is the other function. This is determining which task uses a particular resource and at what time so as to avoid a particular task from holding an Indian resource and refusing to release that resource for use by another task. Then lock is a situation where several tasks hold an Indian resource refusing to release it. What are the main conditions that allow the lock to occur? Number one is unshareable resources. Number two is processes requesting new resources while holding an existing resource. Number three is preemption does not occur or a situation where preemption does not occur. And number four is existence of a circular chain of processes waiting for resources. The difference between preemptive and non-preemptive mode tasking is that in preemptive mode tasking, a process will not necessarily be resumed immediately after an interrupt has been serviced because other processes, preemptive mode tasking, a single user process, if interrupted, will normally be resumed once the interrupt has been serviced and may therefore gain an unfair share of the processor's time. Number seven is input output handling function. This is coordinating all the peripheral devices, making sure that data flows properly between them and sorting out any possible confusion. The operating systems governs input or output of data and their location, storage, and retrieval. So what are the methods of operation and the mode of system access that is executed or utilized by the operating systems? The 11 methods by which operating systems operate the system and the mode of system access that they provide include, number one, mode processing. This allows simultaneous execution of programs on a computer that has several CPUs independently and at the same time and are sharing some or all of the same memory. Number two is multi-programming. In this case, more than one program in the main memory are processed apparently at the same time. Number three is multitasking. This mode allows a single user to run several application programs at the same time with each one sharing the CPU. Number four is mode access. This mode allows interactive facilities to more than one user at a time. Number five is remote job code entry. This mode allows jobs that are entered at a terminal remote from the computer and transmitted into the computer. Number six is bunch processing. In this mode, a job is not processed until it is fully input, and therefore jobs are entered and stored on a disk in a bunch queue, and then they are ran one or more at a time under the control of the operating system. Number seven is interactive computing. In this mode, the computer and the terminal user communicate with each other. Number eight is conversational mode. In this mode, the response 
to the user's message is immediate. Number nine is time sharing. In this mode, the processor time is divided into small units that are called time slices and shared in turn between users, thus enabling them access single computer on a time basis. Number 10 is real-time mode. In this mode, data is processed so quickly that the results are available to influence the activity currently taking place. The output influences the input. Number 11 is virtual storage mode. This mode allows the use of secondary storage devices as an extension of primary storage. Let's now look at the types of operating systems. And in this section, we are going to view the types of operating systems based on the application perspective, just as I have said in the introduction of the topic or heading of this presentation. So the three methods of classifying the operating systems are, number one, is according to the number of tasks that the operating system handles concurrently. Number two is according to the number of users that the operating system can accommodate at the same time. Number three is according to the type of interface that the operating system offers to the user in order to be able to interact with the computer hardware through the use of the application programs. Let's look at classification according to the number of tasks. The two main types of operating systems classified according to the number of tasks handled concurrently are number one, single tasking. The single tasking operating systems allows only one interactive program to be processed at a time in the main memory and the user must exit from the program before loading and running another program. For example, you cannot open and run two programs at the same time. An example of such an operating system is Microsoft Disk Operating System, which we abbreviate as MS-DOS. Number two is multitasking operating system. This is an operating system which allows one to work with more than one program at the same time, therefore carrying out various activities at the same time as the central processing unit switches its operation between programs. One of the techniques used to multitask is time sharing, which permits many users to have apparently simultaneous use of one computer. For example, when one is using the central processing unit, another one may be using the peripherals. Examples of such operating systems include Windows Vista, Windows XP, Apple Macintosh or Mac OS version 6 Multifinder, amongst other related operating systems. Classification according to number of users. The two main types of operating systems classified according to the number of users that can use it at the same time are number one, single user operating systems. These are operating systems that are designed for use by only one person at a time while executing only a single user application. So, it supports only one person at a time who operates one program at a time in an interactive conversational mode. Examples of such operating systems are the disk operating system, DOS, Microsoft Windows 95, 98, 2000, and other similar operating systems or versions of Windows. Number two is multi-user or multi-access operating systems. These operating systems allows more than one person to interactively use the computer 
simultaneously. It's usually installed in a computer that is accessed by many people at the same time. Examples of such operating systems are Unix, Novel, Windows NT, Linux, Windows 2000 Server, amongst other operating systems that are normally found in networks or that allow networks. The third method of classifying the operating systems is according to the user interfaces that they offer. That is what we call according to the human, human computer interface, HCI. The human computer interface is a method of interaction between the computer and the user and determines how easily the user can operate the computer. The three main types of operating systems classified according to the type of user interface that they offer are number one, command line interface, or what we call the command driven interface. This interface allows the user or this type of operating systems allows the user to interact with the computer by typing a command at the prompt, which is found in a command line and then pressing the enter key for the command to be executed. Pressing enter or return key allows the operating system to read the command that has been typed and act on it. The following is an illustration or an image for a command line interface screen, which we call the Microsoft Disk Operating System. As you can see, my dear students and the rest of the learners, is that those operating systems that we classify as command-driven, they involve the entry of the appropriate or respective commands at the prompt. And once it is entered, just as I have said, you press the enter key. And for this reason, the user types or enters a command on the screen like this one that I am showing or I'm displaying on this screen, and then you press enter. For example, from this screen, we can see that this screen is for a disk operating system that belongs to Microsoft Corporation. The user has typed the CD backslash, as you can see on the third line. I will explain what CD backslash is all about. Then after that, the user types another command that is displayed on the fourth line, that is C colon backslash greater than sign dir forward slash w. I will also explain what it means. But as you can see, once that command is entered, we can see volume in drive C has no label. That means that the hand disk has not been assigned a name. And the serial number for this hard disk is CCB2-BF0F. And in addition to that, we are seeing that we have a directory in the root, which is the hard disk. That is directory of C colon backslash, where C colon is a drive letter for the hard disk. Then we can see various files that have an extension, for example, autoexec.bat. We have config.sys, and I'm going to define these extensions later in this presentation. Then we can see we have documents and settings, and we have a file that is called form 3, term 2, 2007, results.xls. In final.log, amongst other details, as you can see, my dear students and the rest of the learners, and we have a folder, for example, uh, Windows, the Windows folder. And then at the bottom, we can see that this drive contains 70 files, which occupy 241, 686 bytes. And it also contains 10 directories. And finally, we have um, 13 million, 268, or that is 13 million, 268,570,112 bytes free. 
So that is information that is displayed on this screen for a command driven interface, which in this case is the disk operating system or what we call the MS-DOS. And therefore simply, the user interacts with the hardware by entering the correct commands on the command line. So command-driven software is often more flexible than menu-driven software, but it is more difficult to learn. This is because the user must have knowledge of the available commands what they do and the rules governing how they should be typed. Examples of such operating systems are the Microsoft Disk Operating System, that is MS-DOS, the Personal Computer Disk Operating System, or what was being called PC-DOS, the OS Stroke 2, and Unix. The prompt is used to indicate to the user that the computer is active, alive, and is waiting a valid command to be entered by the user. For example, from this screen, the last statement is what we are calling the command prompt, which is C colon forward or backslash greater than sign. The C colon backslash greater than sign. This means that the operating system is already waiting for the user to type a command and the command prompt, which in this case is indicated by the drive letter C colon backslash and greater than sign. And that's exactly where you type the command and then press enter key. Each command typed should have the correct syntax. Otherwise an error message is displayed. The syntax is the exact way a command is supposed to be typed based on the rules set for that language in order to attain the correct results. Some examples of disk operating system commands and what they are used to do include the following. And some of them are those ones that I've already explained under the command-driven interface diagram. The first one is CLS. When you type the command CLS under the MS-DOS command prompt, this command clears the screen in order to create a clean space on the screen. And therefore, if this command is entered, for example, on the command prompt that I've already explained, all the contents that I was reading will be cleared, leaving only the command prompt. The next command is DIR. This command, when you type it on the command prompt and then you press enter, it is going to display the contents of the storage medium at once. That is, it will display all the files and directories in that storage media. If the content is more than can fit on the screen at once, some, some scrolls and therefore you may not be able to see them. In other words, if you type the command DIR at the command prompt and then you press enter, if the storage media contains very many files and folders, those files and folders are going to scroll very fast up once until a command prompt will be displayed. And therefore, you'll not be able to see all the content in the storage media because it will not be able to fit on the screen. And therefore, DIR displays the directories and files in the storage medium at once. However, if you type the command DIR forward slash W, what this command is going to do once you press enter is that it is going to display the contents of the directory on the full screen while showing only the file names and extensions displayed across the width of the screen in column form on a single screen and the all at once. So when you type DIR stroke W or DIR forward slash W, 
The list of files and directories will not scroll continuously as we have seen for DIR, but all the directories will be displayed on the screen, but at once in form of columns. What about if you type the command dir forward slash and then you press P? When you enter this command at the DOS prompt or a command prompt and you press enter key, what this command is going to do is that it is going to display all the contents on the screens, but this will give you a chance to view the contents and then display next screen of contents when you press any key to continue to the next screen. And therefore, dir one slash p command causes a pause when one screen is full. In other words, the difference between dir command that I've already explained and dir one slash p is that whereas dir uh, command scrolled all the items continuously on the screen without giving the user an opportunity to see each content. The DIR stroke P displays content that can fit on a screen one group at a time. In other words, once you press DIR stroke P, the operating system will display files and directories or will display the directories on the screen one screen at a time. So when you are through with looking or going through the directories displayed on one screen, you press a key or any key so that it allows you or it allows the operating system to display the next set of files or the next set of directories. Then once you are through, you press that key again or another key again for the next set of directories to be displayed. So in other words, if your storage media contains many directories, what will happen is that when you type dir stroke p, the operating system will display the directories in your storage medium one screen at a time, one screen at a time, and the content will continue being displayed one screen at a time as you continuously press any key to continue until you are through with scrolling all the directories in your storage medium at the point by which a command prompt will be displayed. MD, when you type MD command, what it does is that immediately you press enter key, it is supposed to create a new directory, but you cannot type MD command on its own because this command means make directory, make directory. And therefore, you must tell the operating system what directory you are creating. And therefore, you type this command as md space followed by the name of the directory that you are creating. For example, MD swap directory. And therefore, you type md space MD swap, then you press enter key. When you do that, once you press the enter key, you not get any error message, but you'll be taken back to the command prompt, meaning the directory called mlswap has already been created and therefore the operating system is waiting for you to give it the next command. The next command that you can type is cd. This command, when you type it and you press enter, it changes from one directory to another. The same thing I have said concerning md you cannot type CD on its own because CD stands for change directory. Therefore, you must tell the operating system from which directory you are changing to or to which directory you are changing to based on where you are currently. And therefore, this command CD must be followed by the directory that you want to change it to. So you type it as follows, for example, cd space you press space on your keyboard so you type cd you press space space bar on your keyboard then you type the name of the directory or subdirectory that you are changing to for example mlswap 
So you write it as CD space ML swap. Then you press enter. Remember, whenever you type a command at the command prompt, you must always press enter key so that that command can be acted upon by the operating system. So you can also type CD space ML swap, then forward slash ICT forward slash OS. What ICT and OS are, or what it means is that OS is a subdirectory inside another subdirectory called ICT. And this subdirectory called ICT is inside a directory called MLSwap. And therefore, CD space MLSwap forward slash ICT forward slash OS means that you are changing or you want the operating system to change the directory to the subdirectory called operating systems that is found inside ICT, which is a subdirectory of MLSwap directory. The next command is RD. RD stands for remove directory. This command is used to delete an empty directory from a storage medium. Why am I saying empty directory? It is because most of the uh, command prompt or command operating systems or command line operating systems do not allow you to delete a directory that contains content. This is so that you don't lose unnecessary or you don't lose unnecessarily the data that you want. And therefore, it is advisable that before you remove a directory, you should first of all check its contents. And if possible, you remove that content from that medium so that then the command can be successful. So when you type RD, you must give the operating system the name of the directory or subdirectory that you want to delete or to remove. And therefore, you type it as RD space, the name of the directory or subdirectory you want to delete. For example, MLSwap. Another command is CD backslash. When you type this command, when you are at any subdirectory, what it will do is that it will change from the directory you are currently working on and take you back to the root directory. In other words, cd backslash is a command which takes you out of any directory or subdirectory back to the root directory. CD backslash, you just type it as CD backslash from wherever you will be within the storage medium at the command prompt. And it will take you back to the root directory or to the command prompt once you press the enter key. So those are just a few of examples of the commands that you can use in a command driven interface. There are very many commands that you need to internalize for you to be able to successfully operate your computer using commands. Now, due to the complexity of commands that were being used under the command-driven operating systems, the main driven interface operating systems were developed. So what is main driven interface operating system? This is an operating system which allows a user to interact with the computer by making selections from a list of options. It's suitable and very good for infrequent users and beginners who may have difficulties in recalling commands. It provides the user with a list of options to choose from by typing a letter or by just pressing a key for the options from the keyboard or the mouse. An example of such an operating system was the early versions of Windows operating system and the later versions of DOS, for example, the DOS editor. And this is an illustration of a menu driven interface for the disk operating system. You can see that we have a list of activities you can perform. If, for example, you press Q or K, that will take you to the keyboard. When you press H, 
you'll be choosing the option for how to use this course. When you press A, in this case, it means that you are displaying uh, the content and what you can accomplish within this cooperating system. If you want to know how to use DOS, you press D on your keyboard. If you are using the DOS shell, or you want to use the DOS shell, or what we are calling the, the shell for the, this cooperating system, or you want them that meant to be displayed, you will want to press S. Index, you will want to press I. If you want them to quit from running uh, this cooperating system in a command-driven or in a, in a, a main driven operating system, you could press Q on your keyboard. And as you can see from this menu, if you press the up or down arrow key, you would highlight your choice or just press the color data from your keyboard, just as I've said. And when the lesson you want is highlighted, when the lesson you wanted was highlighted, you would press the enter key for the content and that menu to be displayed. From the main driven operating systems, we moved on to the graphical user interface operating systems or on GUI, which are common up to date or up to date. This operating system was pronounced as GUI. It's also called WIMP, that is Windows icons, menus, and pointing devices. The reason being that these are operating systems that the user interacts with through use of Windows icons, menus, and the pointing devices. It is a user-friendly operating system that represents command in the form of small pictures on the screen that can be easily selected to issue a command using a pointing device. An icon is a graphical representation of a command. It is the easiest to use when interacting with the central processing unit. In other words, the graphical user interface operating systems are the easiest to use in comparison to the menu driven and the command driven operating systems. This is because these operating systems allows you to use graphics or images, menus and the keystrokes in order to choose commands, start the programs, see list of files and perform other activities. A menu is a list of commands from which to choose from to execute a certain command. This is an illustration of a graphical user interface screen. And I'm very sure, my dear students and the rest of the learners, that you have come across this type of screens. This is because these are the most common operating systems in use today. And even most of those ones that we're using to learn have these kind of screens. This screen is called a window. And as you can see, it contains menus. It contains icons too. And generally these rectangular portions that are displayed on the screen are normally referred to as windows. So the graphical user interface operating systems allow you to interact with various content through the use of various windows. And then what you just do is to click on a menu or double click on icons in order to perform the task that you want. This graphical user interface screen is mostly for Windows operating systems. Another feature of the graphical user interface, just as I have said, is the use of Windows. A window is a rectangular boxed area on a computer screen. The windows can be for open files, open programs, open directories, or disk drives. The windows appear over a common visual background that we call desktop. For you to learn more about desktop, I advise you to visit the YouTube channel by the name 
MLE Swap ICT and access part two of this series on operating systems application perspective, part two of two, in which I have explained and described the desktop in depth. And desktop is the area on the display screen where icons are ungrouped. The many components of a graphical user interface operating system that makes it to be called WIMP, just as I have said, are a pointer, the icons, windows, menus, and it also uses a pointing device. Examples of graphical user interface of operating systems are all Microsoft Windows, that is various versions of Windows. For example, Windows XP, Windows 10, Windows 11, and others. The OS Stroke 2 operating system, Linux, Apple Macintosh, Presentation Manager, among the others. Let's now look at the factors that you would consider when choosing an operating system for your computer. The first factor to consider is the hardware provision and basic design of the computer that you want um, to purchase an operating system for. Number two is the applications intended for the computer. This is because various operating systems support various types of applications. Number three is the method of communication with the computer. That is, whether you want to be communicating using menus, using commands, or using graphics. Number four is the method of operating the computer. Number five is the availability of that operating systems in the market. Number six is its reliability, that is whether it can be consistently give you correct results and security for your data or your content. Number seven is its user friendliness, that is how easy it is for you to be able to use that operating systems. Number eight is the documentation available. That is, if the operating systems the provider has been able to supply you with various documents that explain to you how to use that operating system. Number nine is the cost of the operating systems. Number 10 is the number of users that it can support at a time. So what characteristics are you supposed to look for in order to tell whether your operating system is user-friendly? Number one is it's relatively easy or it should be relatively easy for you to start using it. That means you can use this software with minimal assistance. Number two is this software should be self-contained with its manuals. Number three, the user completes required tasks with minimum effort. Number four, it's robust and reliable. Number five, a user-friendly software can adjust to different levels of expertise between users. Number six, it makes the user to feel in control of what is going on. Number seven, it behaves in a logical and a consistent manner. So how does the operating system organize information or how would you organize information using your operating systems? The operating system organizes information in terms of files and folders in a storage medium. This means that related information is stored in a file, then files with similar information are stored in a common folder or directory, and then all the related folders are stored in a certain storage medium. In other words, if you have a storage medium 
for example, the hard disk, this operating system allows various related content to be organized in a form of directories. And then under each of the directory, the related files can be stored in it. When we talk about a file, I am referring to a collection of related data and information that is given a single name. For example, if you have typed some information concerning a subject called English, then you can save or create a file with that content, and then you give it the name English. And then you store this file on a certain storage medium, for example, the hard disk. And therefore, that's why we define a file as a collection of related data and information that is given a name and is stored on a storage medium from which it can be retrieved when needed. And this storage medium can be, for example, a hard disk and other types of storage media. To help one to manage data on a storage medium, the operating system includes utility software that we call a file manager. A file manager is a software that helps you manage, organize, and manipulate information into easily accessible units called files and folders. It identifies a storage device with the use of a device letter. A device letter is a unique identifier for each different storage device in your computer. In other words, the operating systems identifies or distinguishes between various storage media with the use of certain drive letters. For example, if the operating system on the computer that you purchased is able to access data on a floppy disk, then that floppy drive that is used to access the floppy disk is identified as a colon. Therefore, a colon is a drive letter for the floppy drive. If you have a second floppy drive in the same computer, it will be given B colon. The C colon is a drive letter that is used to identify a hard disk. If you have a second hard disk or a second partition of a hard disk, it will be given the next letter, which is D colon. However, if your computer only contains a single hard disk, it will be assigned the drive letter C colon. Then the D colon, in this case where the computer contains only a single hard disk, the D colon will be the drive letter for identifying the optical disks. And therefore, the drive letters for each drive varies depending on the number of similar drives installed in a single computer. In this case, if, for example, your computer contains two floppy disk drives, two hard disk drives, two optical disk drives, and, for example, a flash disk drive, then the letters for floppy disks will be A colon and B colon. The drives for the two hard disks will be C colon and D colon. Then the two drives for optical disks will be E colon and F colon. And therefore, in this case, the flash disk drive will be given the next drive letter in that order. Information on a storage media is then organized into directories, which we also call folders. A folder is another name for directory. And we use this term mostly when we are using the graphical user interface operating systems. While well, directory is mostly the term that we use when we are referring to the command-driven operating system storage areas for data. However, we use a folder or folder and directory terms interchangeably. A folder or directory is a named storage area where the user can store related files to enable easy access. What we mean is if, for example, you are typing letters for invitation 
for a graduation ceremony and you have several letters or that is several files because those files contain information to do with the graduation then you can store them in a directory or a folder called the graduation then if you are using the same computer to store other types of information for example various cards or continuous assessment tests that you have been able to administer to your students then you can create a folder or a directory called the cards in which you can store all the files to do with the cards a large directory or a folder can therefore have uh, other folders inside it this means that a large directory or folder can be further subdivided into smaller units so that you are able to further identify those files that are related from the rest and therefore a directory or folder that is found inside another directory or within another directory or folder is called a subdirectory or subfolder an operating system then uses a path name to which is the device letter the folder followed by subfolder file name and extension to trace a file and its location this is an example of what i mean if for example you have a file called english which is a document file that has been stored in a subfolder called form one inside another subfolder called card two which is found in a folder or large directory called mikidori house that is in a storage medium called c colon then for you to be able to access this file called english.doc that is saved in a folder called mikidori house but in a subfolder called form one that is located in cat two subfolder then the path that the operating system has to follow will be one the operating system will check the storage medium that contains your file which we call the root directory and in this case it is the hand disk that is abbreviated by c colon then the operating system will proceed to check that large directory so the operating system will move on to the folder or the large directory called mikidori house inside that directory the operating system will check or will go to the subfolder called cat2 inside cat2 subfolder we have several folders or subfolders of which one of them is called form one so the operating system will move on to form one and then once it is there it will be able to access the file that we call english which is a document file and therefore using command line operating system we can read this uh, path as c colon backslash mikidori gauss backslash card two backslash form one backslash english dot doc how is this illustrated using a graphical user interface of operating system so the following is a window illustrating how the operating system organizes information and the path to the file that we have called english document file so my dear students and the rest of the learners you can see that we have a window open called form one and this is the one that i've highlighted on this screen so from this window you can see that we have several items we have several items one of them as you can see is the directory or what we are calling the root directory that is c colon so inside the c that is the hand disk we have several folders we have config.msi we have documents and settings we have in this case this one we have this we have this but our interest is this folder so inside the hand disk we have 
one folder by the name Mikidoli Gauss. When you open Mikidoli Gauss, you are able to find a subfolder in it called CAT2. As you can see, this CAT2 contains two subfolders, one called Form 1 and the other one called Form 2. However, when you open Form 1, you'll be able to see this content on this side. So inside Form 1, we have two files. One is computer file, a file called computer, and another one called English. And you can see that computer is a Microsoft One document created in the year 2010, and the time is there. The second one is English, and it is a Microsoft One document. And therefore, you can see from this screen, just as I've said, that if you want to access the file called computer, or that is called English, if you want to access the document called English, you have to open the storage medium first, that is on disk C. Then you move on to the folder called Mickey Doring House. Then you proceed to CAT2. Then inside the CAT2, you open from one, from where you are able to access the file called English. So these arrows that I have used here are to show you the path that is followed by the operating system. This is the path. So you can see, just as I have said, we have various folders. And Mikituring House is one of the folders. And then computer and English are files. A file location table, FAT, is a file that stores information about the physical location of every file on a storage media. The main directory in a storage media is called the root directory. It is usually the root drive for a storage medium. For example, the root directories for the following new storage media that have no files or folders on them are, just as I have said, we have C column for hand disk. For the floppy disk, which of course are outdated these days, we had a column. For optical disks, for example, CD, we can use D colon. So those are the root directories. Root directory usually refers to the storage media that contains your directories or subdirectories and the files. Though you can just store your files directly on a storage medium, that is, at the root directory, it is usually important to organize the related files together into their own folders in order to make it easy to access, view, retrieve, and manage those files. Creating folders in a storage medium is meant to help the user divide a large storage media into small, manageable storage locations. Files are therefore organized in a storage medium in a tree structure, or what we call hierarchical structure, for easy access and retrieval. It is also called a folder tree, which can look as follows. This is what I've already demonstrated. You can see we have desktop up there. We have my documents. We have my computer. Then we move on to the storage media, like local disk C. And then we have the folders and subfolders, as you can see. And then we also have files. So the arrows that are used here illustrate what we call a tree structure. That means data or information is organized in form of files that are stored in folders, commencing with the root directory. So from the root directory, we move on to folders. Inside the folders, we find subfolders. Inside those subfolders, we can have sub subfolders etc. And then inside the subfolders, we have 
the files. So this structure is what we are calling a computer or further tree structure. Every file has three main parts, and this is the information that you used to be able to identify between a file and a folder, because it's only the files that contain these three parts. The first one is the file name. Now, the file name is common even for the folders. It is a unique name that you give to a file of information, for example, OS. The name of the file is followed by a period. A period is a dot that separates between a file name and an extension. And the third part is the extension. This is usually an optional set. And I'm saying optional because you may not need to type this part as a user, but it is normally allocated automatically by the operating system based on the application program that we are using to create the file. So extension is an optional set of three characters that suggests the type of information held by a file. For example, doc. Therefore, if you have created, for example, a file called operating system exam using Microsoft Word in the computer, you can save it in the computer as os.doc. Then if you want to save it in the subfolder called ICT in the hard disk, then you should, or you could save it using the following path c colon backslash ml swap backslash ict backslash os dot doc this means that the file the document file called os has been saved or stored in a subfolder called ict that is found in the folder called ml swap that is found on a storage media which is the hard disk therefore c colon is the root directory MLD swap is the main directory, ICT is a subfolder inside the MLD swap directory, and inside the subfolder, we are able to find a file or a document file that is called OS. Even if you don't add an extension in your file, just as I have said, the operating system will add it automatically for you based on the kind of file you are creating on the program or the program you are using to create it. An extension tells you and the computer what type of file it is. The following are some examples of file extensions and the type of information that they contain. Number one is SYS. When you have this extension, it refers to system files. This normally entails the drivers to control devices. Dot com or com is for command files. Exe is for executable files. BAT indicates that the file is a branch file containing a series of DOS commands. DAT refers to data files. That's the files that you create on your own. Doc gives the information that the file is a documented file created using a program, for example, Microsoft Word. That is Microsoft Word, which is a word processing package. XLS indicates that the file is a spreadsheet file that was created, for example, using Microsoft Excel, which is a spreadsheet program. TXT is an extension for text files that is files which are associated with the Notepad program. WPD illustrates that that is a one perfect document. JPG or JPEG indicates that the file is a graphics file, which is mostly used for photos and illustrations. BMP, that is .bmp, indicates that the file is a bitmap graphics file that is a file which was uh, which is containing photos and illustrations 
PDF indicates that the file is a portable document file. That is, it is a portable document format. A file type that displays finished text and graphics in an application such as Acrobat Reader. .hlp indicates that the file is an help program. Files that the computer uses when booting are usually stored in the root directory. A path is used by operating system to keep track of your subdirectories where your files are kept. Once a file is created, the operating system has its date and the time of creation for the purposes of accessing that file quickly. When creating files, it is always important that you give them meaningful names that suggest its content in order to help you be able to remember and quickly access your information. The three main types of files that are normally identified by the operating systems are the system files, the application files, and the document files. What are system files? System files are files that contains critical information that is critical for the operation of the computer. The operating system needs these files in order to be able to run. Some of the most common system files are autoexec.bat, which is a bunch file, the command.com, which is a command file, the config.sys, meaning it's a system file, io.sys, system file, msdos.sys, user.dat, system.dat, win.com. Mind dear students and the rest of the learners, it is important to note that there are many file extensions and each identifies a certain type of file. So whenever you come across SYS as an extension, for example, config.sys, io.sys, ms.sys, sys simply means that that is a system file. Number two is application files. These are files that host information from programs that are used by the user to accomplish certain tasks. They are therefore program files. Example of such files or such programs include Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, amongst others. So any files created using a program like Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint, and others, all those are called application files. Number three is what we call the document files. These are files that are created when working with an application program. Now, I want to distinguish or let me differentiate between the document files and application files. When we talk about application files, for example, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel ETC, these are files that indicate that the content are a set of instructions that enable the user accomplish a certain task. So Microsoft Word file is an application file, meaning that that is a file used to accomplish a certain task. For example, creating documents. MS Excel is an application file, meaning that it is a program that is used to perform a certain task. So the content in it are a set of instructions that enable the user perform a certain task. But document files are the products of an application file. What I mean is, if for example, you create a document using Microsoft Word application, then that document which you have created using Microsoft Word will be a document file. For example, if you create a letter that you want to send to your friends using Microsoft Word application, then that document which you save as letters will be a document file. 
And therefore, that's why we are saying that document files are files that are created when working with an application program. In other words, you create document files using respective application programs. A file system is concerned with the logical organization of the information and provides a means of sorting, retrieving, and sharing files. So which devices are normally under the control of the operating systems? So the devices under operating system control include the following. Number one is the processor. The operating system decides which program will be allowed into the processor and for how long. This is because the central processing unit can only execute one program at any one time. And therefore, the operating system carefully controls and monitors the processes that the CPU is undertaking. The operating system arranges the tasks according to priority and has ability to stop a particular task to allow the processor to service another in case there are several tasks requiring the processing thus avoiding competition between them. My dear students and the rest of the learners, if you want to know how the operating system is able to manage various processes or tasks, visit MLSWAP ICT YouTube channel and then access all the videos by the name Process Management Using Operating Systems. And once you listen, to those presentations, you'll be able to see how the operating system is able to manage or identify the priorities of tasks and also make decisions as to which task to perform fast and which is to wait. The other resource that is controlled by the operating systems is memory. The operating system keeps track of what parts of memory are in use and by whom and what parts are free. The operating system determines which task will remain in memory awaiting for execution and which one will be sent back to secondary storage to wait in order to avoid many tasks from occupying the memory at the same time. The kernel is the small special part of the operating system that must be loaded to RAM during the booting process, and it contains the most necessary commands and procedures. The third resource is storage devices. The operating system keeps track of the information on the storage devices, and it controls how the information is written to and read from the storage device. It also utilizes the free space on the hard disks to enhance the performance of the computer by temporarily holding tasks on it that were in RAM ready for processing, but have to wait for some time. The fourth resource is the input and output devices, that is IO devices. The operating system controls the allocation of I.O. devices to the various programs that may require them and attempt to resolve any conflicts which arise. It also monitors the state of each I.O. device and signal any faults that it detects. The operating system controls the flow of data from the time of input to the time the user receives it as information while ensuring that the right data reaches the processor at the right time, because most I.O. devices are slower than the processor. It also defines the various I.O. ports that are found on the computer. The fifth resource are the communication devices and the ports. Communication is how the various devices and programs in and out of the computer system send and receive messages from one another and from the processor. The operating system controls the overall communication process between various tasks 
and the computers. External communication is achieved by connecting a device to a communication port using a communication media like cables or even wireless communication. Let's now look at the installation and the configuration of an operating systems. When we talk about installation, we are referring to the process of copying program files into the hard disk. It is especially meant to copy executable files onto the hard disk in a format that allows the computer to run the program. To correctly install an operating system, always read the manufacturer's documentation or what we call the manuals in order to get correct installation procedures and requirements. In order to install, for example, Windows operating systems in a computer that does not have any operating systems, or if you wanted to reinstall Windows of operating systems in the case it fails to function, you must have a startup disk for the same or ensure that the storage media that contains the operating system is bootable. You can also install a later version of an operating system to upgrade your previous operating system. This reconfigures your installed operating systems by adding the new components. Each operating system requires a minimum computer hardware requirements or what we call configuration. And therefore, it is not all the operating systems that can be installed in every computer. For example, the minimum hardware requirements for Windows 95 and 98 were IBM PC compatible 8486 or higher computer processor, the hard disk, which was at least 200 MB of free space, at least 16 MB of RAM, at least one floppy drive, and remember that was then, the CD-ROM drive, Windows compatible monitor, and in graphics adapter, mouse, network adapter, and fax modem card. So those were the requirements for a computer which would allow Windows 95 or Windows 98 then. And the same applies even to the today's operating systems. For example, Windows 11 cannot be installed in some of the computers that have been running Windows 10. So if you have already installed an operating system that is functioning well, to upgrade it to a newer version, you are required to insert the new version's media on its respective drive. Then open the icon that we called my computer, though in Windows 10, for example, it is normally referred to as this PC icon. So you double click on that icon by the name my computer or this PC. Then you double click on the medium's drive icon. For example, if your storage media is drive E, you double click on drive E icon. Once you do that, that drives location or storage location will open and therefore from the list of files displayed you look for a file by the name setup.exe once you see it you double click it however some of the operating system storage media like compact disks may automatically run that means once you insert it into its drive the operating system that is already existing or run it automatically. However, this will not happen or may not happen if the PC or your computer is clean and it does not have the previous operating systems. However, once you insert it or once you insert that storage media on its drive, you can boot your system using that media. Once you have inserted the media that contains your program, and you double click on setup or setup program runs automatically, you are then required to follow the instructions that will be generated by the setup program. However, just as I've said, if the computer does not have the operating system or the current operating system is not functioning well, you can install the operating system as follows. One, 
inside the operating systems startup or a boot up disk or the disk containing the operating system into the respective disk drive. If it's a flash disk, insert it on the flash disk drive. If it's an optical disk, for example, DVD, insert it on the DVD drive. Then switch on the computer. If the operating system setup program loads automatically and a setup wizard appears, follow the setup program's instructions in order to install the operating system. Otherwise, if that is not the case, type the drive letter that contains the storage media that contains your operating system. For example, you can type um, D colon, A colon, E colon, or whichever is the drive letter for the device that contains your operating system. And then you press enter. If you have a folder in that drive with the operating system, you need to change to that directory by typing or by selecting. Then once you're in the right directory that contains the setup file, type setup.exe and press enter. Then follow the setup instructions displayed that will guide you on the rest of the installation process. Lastly, what are you supposed to do if your Windows operating system has certain errors or problems? So troubleshooting is the process of diagnosing and trying to fix or resolve hardware and software related problems and solve other technical related problems. Some problems that may occur either during the installation or even later include, number one is failure to launch operating systems. Number two is a situation where your computer hangs now and then. Another problem is a situation where your computer starts abnormally, that is, it restarts without you instructing it to do so. Number four is displaying a blue screen with a fatal error message, which you normally call the screen of death. Another one is a situation where the operating system's setup program loads automatically and a setup wizard appears. You follow the setup instructions, but the program hangs at a certain point. So if the operating system setup program loads automatically and a setup wizard appears, you should follow the setup program's instructions to install the operating system. Otherwise, if that does not happen, just as I've said, type the drive letter and change the directory that contains what you are looking for or that contains the setup file. And this information I've already sent where I've said you also click on setup. So these steps five, six, and seven is just a repetition. So what are some of the causes of the problems that we have already listed? Number one is what we call the hardware conflict or incompatibility due to a missing file or interrupt request. Number two, these problems or the problems we have already mentioned may be as a result of a problem in the installation process. They may also be as a result of your hard disk boot sector having issues or problems such as virus infection or damage. These problems can also arise due to insufficient system memory. They can also be due to interrupt request conflicts. They can also be as a result of corrupted system Windows registry. When you talk about a registry, a registry is a database where Windows stores its configuration information, such as system hardware, installed programs, and property settings. To resolve these problems, you can perform any 
of the following tasks. In other words, if you experience any of the problems that we have looked at and others that I've not even mentioned, you can follow or execute or perform some of the following tasks in order to resolve those problems. Number one, it is important that you study troubleshooting guide that comes with your operating system or start the Windows Hello program if your, computer, if your computer's Windows operating system is functional. So you start the Windows Hello program by clicking on the Hello command from the Start menu. If the OS can load successfully, and then you follow the troubleshooter's steps as they are. Number two, during booting process, you can hold down F8 key on the keyboard in order to get startup options from which you can choose to start the computer in safe mode or display the command prompt so as to know what has the problem. Number three is to use the device manager control panel dialog box to check for the devices that are causing problems. Once you have started the device manager, you click on an install update driver or other tasks for the device that is indicated as having issues with the use of, for example, an exclamation mark among the others. For you to be able to access the device manager in your computer, especially if you are using Windows 10, you just need to type device manager under the search icon from the taskbar which is normally located next to the start button. And then you click on device manager from the list that will be displayed. The other way of solving some of the problems is to reinstall the operating system if the problem that you have experienced persists and in case that problem is beyond repair. We have come to the end of this presentation, which is part one of a two-part series of presentations on the topic of operating systems application perspective. You can therefore proceed to part two of two of this topic that is already posted in MLSWAP ICT YouTube channel. Congratulations, therefore, for learning part one and two or part one of two for operating systems application, the topic. You can access part two of two for this topic and more other computer or ICT videos by clicking or tapping on Emily Swap ICT button just below this video in YouTube. You can also subscribe this channel by tapping on subscribe button below this video if it's not currently reading as subscribed. You can also visit and subscribe to MLSWAP Live Skills YouTube channel for you to be able to access free life skills, motivational and inspirational resources. If you have any questions or suggestions or recommendations or for any further correspondence, kindly write it to us through the email mlswap at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening to me and be blessed.